Okay. I think this is right. This is the first time I've ever like recorded anything. So, hi. I'll be presenting on chapter one of Youth Cultures in China by Chloe and Fung, Youth in Power, Education, Family, and the State. This chapter was published in 2017, which means the data is pretty up to date, lucky for me, and current with today's trends. To be honest, I was rather nervous to present on this topic because, from my standpoint, I do not truly know how the youth of China, which most of you my classmates are, it's literally your life, and this is solely based off of the readings, so I hope this is not an ac- this is an accurate representation. I'd be happy to hear your opinions at the end. This chapter starts off by introducing the May 4th movement, the most important student movement in the early decades of the 20th century, and Liang Qichao, Chinese philosopher, scholar, journalist, and supporter of the movement. Famously, he said, when youth are strong, the nation is strong. When youth move forward, the nation moves forward. This sets the tone for the chapter. This chapter and the whole book overall explores how Chinese youth were able to find their own source of power, autonomous from their parents' ideals through media, everyday life practices, and technologies of the self. A study among students in Fujian asked respondents what the most what was most troublesome to them. 50% replied they don't have a clear goal to fight for. 48.9% listed the difficulty of finding a job as a key problem, and 38.5% referred to study pressure. High expectations implemented on youth by their parents often lead to youth living the life that is implied for them, or governmentality. Governmentality here refers to the conduct of conduct, meaning that there exists knowledge or a set of rules in society that defines, restricts, and normalizes norms, practices, obligations, responsibilities, and disciplines of an individual, a family, or an organization. Youth in urban China fall into the orbit of family and private life, school and public life, and pop in politics in both domains. With only rare exceptions in rural areas, youth have been segregated from production and largely put under these systems to learn, reproduce, and practice the ideologies that are being taught daily. This chapter is broken up into three sections, so I'll also break up my presentation accordingly. The sections are as follows. Political values and party membership, family and familialism, this is actually Xi Jinping's family in the picture, and pedagogy and education. The authors Clout and Fung state that these are the three embl- emblematical macro-cultural controls that help map the regimes Chinese youth have to navigate. So the first section is political values and party membership. The section of the chapter explains the connections between party membership and youth employment. Unemployment rates are very high amongst Chinese youth that it is difficult to get a job. Party members have an advantage when looking for jobs, which leads to more youth becoming members in order to make money. By the end of 2018, the party had over 90 million members. During 2018 alone, the CCP recruited over 2 million new members. Of those new members, 44.9% held junior college degrees or above. 80% of those were aged 35 or younger. Youth Unemployment in China Given that the Chinese working population increases by an average of 20 million people annually, and that there are only 10 to 16 million available jobs, the job search for youth is expected to be an uphill struggle. The author calls this the cracks in the rice bowl of the Chinese youth. The unemployment rate between the ages of 16 and 24 is 13.8%. The official national average is 6%. And this only accounts for urban youth, leaving out the rural and migrant populations. This chart is based off estimates from the International Labor Organization. As we can see, the overall trend in the last decade is that unemployment rates have climbed quite drastically. These days, the Communist Party membership is important in particular to secure a leadership position in a public institution. It is also important to note that most likely, no youth would be willing to utter his or her views about the party in public. Overall, youth share an ambivalent attitude towards the party. Partyism limits their possibility of being critical about the party, and this blocks the option to develop an oppositional ideology. From the standpoint of the youth, being a party member has evolved from an ideological choice towards a choice meant to further one's career and life choices. Not only is the party a network of control, but also a network of both positive and negative influence. Youth have to navigate through this while holding on to their own values, attitudes, and worldviews. So the second section is family and familialism. I feel like I'm saying that wrong. In the 1990s, family was listed to be the most important thing to Chinese citizens, and familialism is very strong in China. I think this is still true. In China, hegemonically, parents invest their hope for the future in their children. This increases not only the burden, but also results in a sort of close surveillance and other problems such as loneliness or stress. 
Of course, I didn't grow up in China, as most of you may know, but I do feel these pressures from my grandmother who lived there most of her life. She always said I had to be very well-groomed like a princess and get good grades and graduate university, marry a guy from a good family, and of course she would prefer it to be a Chinese boy, and get a good job. I do think that these are good goals, but the pressures of living up to her expectations often make me anxious, especially since my sister and I are the only children in our generation, meaning our family name ends with us. I can imagine what these pressures are even more impending on children born in families with a one-child policy, where all the expectation falls on them. And there's a picture of me and my sister with my grandparents. With that, I completely agree with the author's point that the aim of youth is to never completely disagree desegregate from the cultural control of the family, especially since the family is both a source of material support and cultural capital. Though interviews done by the authors, they have concluded that although family has a large say about their lives, they do not feel oppressed by this control. In conclusion, familialism effectively becomes a value that tactfully molds gender and marriage norms in Chinese society, legitimizing heterosexual love, indexing practices of marriage and family life, and reinforcing the collective roles of monitoring gender norms and values. So the next section is pedagogy and education. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I've never heard of the word pe pedagogy, and I had to look up how to say it. So just in case, it is the method and practice of teaching, especially as an academic subject or theoretical concept. In this case, the mechanism works on the basis of an interlocking time and space between school and family when it comes to s spreading ideology. The chapter starts off by stating that the educational institutions in China are the most intermediate platforms designed to govern youth. It is also important to note that the education also primes the role of integrating youth with the ideological imperative of the party. To this day, learning about the party's position leaders, ideology, and Marxist doctrine still remain in the curriculum as a legacy of control and a tool of patriotic education. I think that for China, instilling the nationalist ideology as the students' impressionable minds is one of the key reasons that China has continued to be a one-party state and why citizens have so much faith in the party throughout their lives. This is really different from Canada, in my opinion. I don't really remember learning anything about the Canadian government in, in school. And what I did learn, <laughs> I don't remember being all that positive. The pressure of the education system in China is exceptionally high. In a study among college students, where they're asked if their main source of mental pressure was to study was the ranked the highest at 52.1%. I think this is also similar in Canada. This chapter also discussed the Gaokao exam. This is the National Higher Education Entrance Exam. Entrance exam. The Gaokao is so demanding that it also steers youth away from thinking creatively or independently, thus leaving a hardly any or no space for youth to think alternatively from a straight agenda. This is from the reading. To me, this is concerning, especially since children at this age are at such a developing stage of life. Traditional schooling is a societal norm in China, so to stray away from this education was be s to be seen as deviant. The purdy, the fur this further ensures that students grow up embracing ideas of the one-party state. Have any of you taken this exam? This is a video posted by the South China Morning Post of an elementary age student in Hong Kong who shares his frustrations with school. I know this is technically not China, but from what I found, the lived experiences are similar, and this video is pretty cute.
I think that's enough. Um, I think in university, almost, almost all of us are stressed out. However, in Canada, amidst my elementary and high school education, my stress level is really low and I rarely had any homework. Chinese youth are under an, amount of, an immense amount of pressure. Trying to both Tying to both family and education, there are countless articles on how Asian parents' high expectations for their children lead to mental health stress. This stress, alongside the struggle to find employment, have put a lot of weight on Chinese youth's shoulders when they try to navigate their future. This pressure is to, is what Chinese refer to as the driving force, or dong li. So in conclusion, today in the information age, it would be expected that the, the youth that they youth with more resources available today, both material and non-material, they are better equipped to contest the political control of the state, explore different cultural scripts beyond the demands of the school, family, and the state, and to imagine a whole new world. However, that doesn't mean that the youth are completely free, blocked by what some call the cultural firewall of China. This is not to say that this is the case of all Chinese youth, though. There are now more than ever slightly divergent youth. Video produced by a branch of Vice Media called ID that introduced Chinese youth in Shanghai who are breaking through the firewall. They also mentioned the DACO generation. I'd say that they're a good example of them, a group of Chinese people that are breaking through the firewall. The Shanghai people, they want more and more and more. China's internet control is considered more extensive and more advanced than in any other country in the world. But tearing through the surface in Shanghai is the community of boundary-breaking designers, musicians, and artists. The city is very fast, like fast BPM. Working their way around China's Great Firewall, artists and creatives are determined to make their mark regardless of authority's restrictions. It's not just about getting drunk, I mean, that's part of it, but like organizing a community and having people together and giving form to this culture. This city is a rich canvas of creativity that's challenging the status quo with new aesthetics and distinct local sounds. Shanghai现在发展非常快，然后其实呃小时候它完全不是这个样子。小的时候，像其实信息的来源非常少，没有也没有互联网。那只要其实只要一有机会，就会去找这种，就是所有的唱片或者磁带或者黑胶，呃，
就感觉你是完全被限制住，没有自由的那种感觉。你想，就感觉很不自由。如果说会因为这种事情就生气，比如说 ，Even though there's the big firewall that blocks a lot of information, people still find a way to 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 find out what works at the moment. 这首歌是 EP 里面的。I want to talk about that later, the frustration, but we'll go over that when we go、uh, to my question section. Asking, how then do youth navigate through these multiple forces of state, school, and family? How do they find their own space, their own dreams, their own possibilities? The answer would be not until China produces or allows opportunities for youth to produce moments in which they can carve out their own place in society. The authors say that these moments could happen at events such as concerts or producing one's own art, as we saw in the video. Overall, the authors say that it seems that Chinese youth are not moving forward, but are moving rhizomic, fragmented, and dispersed. So I want to find an example of someone who is finding their own dream and making their own way. And the example I thought of was Lexi Liu. She was a finalist on Rap of China, so many of you may already know her. Lexi did well in high school. Actually, she I think she graduated a year early, but ended up dropping out of university and decided to pursue music. This is her song "Bygone," and there are some notable lyrics from her song here. I'm gonna play the clip if I can figure it out. At fifty. In an interview with Days Magazine, she revealed that this is her most personal song, and that when she shared the song with her family and talking about what was happening in her life, her mother broke down in tears. She stated that she didn't want to have to drag her parents into her songs, but she had to somehow since they were such a big part of her life, and thus tied to get back again. And we're talking about familialism. I think this well exemplifies the struggles Chinese youth、um, have in regards to family, school, and other internal pressures. In my opinion, in regards to the chapter, it's hard to base a case of statistics that could be skewed. In my opinion, this data could have been skewed by the CCP, and it would be unlikely that any statistics that do not favor the CCP would be openly published. I also think that this answers that they may not be authentic, and citizens may be worried to slander the party. However, in regards to the content, due to my positionality, I think that the societal conditions in which Chinese youth grow up in are controlling. But I understand why China has done this, and clearly it's been successful. They're still a one-party state. I certainly value having, have、um, being able to form my own opinions and finding my place in the world by myself, without the bias of my education, immense pressure from my family or governmentality. I think this is important that all youth get to have this freedom. I think that Chinese youth are being constrained from reaching their full potential by being censored and under high stress. But I do think China is changing, as seen in the ID video. Just in the last few years, I've noticed a rapid influx of new young talent emerging from China, from musicians and artists to fashion designers. This is talent that would not usually be supported by the society, who would traditionally want their children to work as engineers or doctors. Thanks to media, everyday practices, and technology as itself, I think this is a new beginning of a new wave of Chinese youth that are not afraid to challenge hegemonic norms and have power to change China as we know it and find their dreams. Don't forget, as Liang Qichao said, "When youth are strong, the nation is strong." When the youth move forward, the nation moves forward as well. So to finish this off, thanks for listening. <laughs>、um, I have a couple questions, which I guess I'll do that part when I'm when this is done playing. But the first one is: Do you feel an internal pressure that you must make your family proud, and how has this at all limited how you affect or you live how you live your life now? For example, like. Would you be living your life differently if your family didn't care or didn't pressure you to live your life a certain way? The second question is more for international students or, or the students living in China. But do you think that coming to Canada, whereas you don't have to worry about the firewall, has allowed you to become more creative or and or opinionated? 
And if you don't live in China like me, do you think the firewall is limiting? Do you think that if there was no firewall there, that there would be more opportunities and stuff like that as well? And the last question, I used the example of Luxi Lu, but do you have any other examples of Chinese youth here breaking the mold? Anyways, thank you so much. And yeah.